What is going on, everyone? My name is Eli Martyr. Thank you so much for joining me here on the Free Melon Society. Today, we're going to be answering a YouTube comment regarding soy. So I had been asked, would you comment about soy and or tofu? So let's get into that. What do I think about soy and or tofu? And the first thing to say about questions like this is, okay, well, we, we have to put these questions into context. What do I what do I think about them? It depends. It depends on who's asking. It depends on that particular person's hangups. It depends on what that particular person's after. So I'm going to tailor that response depending on who's asking, right? As people in the health community that are helping to give our advice to people, we always have to be mindful of, of who's asking. So it depends on what you want from your diet. It depends on what your particular aspirations are that will vary the answer of what about soy, right? Let's get the broad strokes out of the way. If we're talking about conventional soy, all right? Now, the vast majority, at least in North America, okay, I'm speaking for North America, Canada, the United States, at least in North America, the vast, 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 vast majority of soy is genetically modified soy, okay? Now, if we're talking about genetically modified soy, the answer is unambiguously, emphatically no. Stay clear away from soy in its GMO processed form. Because there's no labeling required for GMO soy, then that means anytime you're eating at some Japanese restaurant and you get those edamame appetizers, anytime you have any kind of soy sauce, any kind of soy based anything in any sauce or seasoning or, or soup or whatnot, unless it specifically says that it is organic or non-GMO, then you are guaranteed to be getting GMO soy and that soy, GMO soy, is extremely dangerous for your health. Now, as much as animal experiments aren't exact equivalents for humans, we there is a reason why we use rats, and it's because things that tend to poison rats tend to poison humans. And studies on rats that were fed diets of GMO soy and other GMO products as well, they show the development of excessive growths, excessive tumors all over their body extensive lung damage, extensive organ damage, kidney failures, generational inherited diseases passed on to the young, growths, boils, tumors, just all sorts of absolute ridiculous nonsense. There was a famous, oh, here it is right here. The Seralini says GM study retraction was based on unscientific double standards. Uh, Professor Gilles Eric Seralini was one of the um, one of the notable champions who brought to light the dangers of GMO products. He did an extensive study that was accepted at first with all scientific credulity, all right, and cr credibility. His experiments were seen as scientifically accurate. And then, of course, once the dust settles and the the GMO lobby and the biotech companies start to uh, start to realize the danger that this type of information poses, then all of a sudden people reverse their decisions. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, the studies were flawed and, and inaccurate and blah, blah, blah. You, you know how it works, all that nonsense. So if we're talking about GMO soy or any soy in any product, even in trace amounts, so check all your products. If there's any soy anything, soy lecithin, soy, isolate, uh, soy protein isolate, uh, the textured vegetable proteins, all of this nonsense. If this is not specified organic, you're eating GMO soy, and that is an absolute no-no, okay? So let's be clear on that. So we're not talking about GMO soy for this, for the rest of this uh, video. So what are my thoughts on soy? Let's talk about soy just in general, okay? So the general cooked and processed form of soy, assuming that it is non-GMO. Is that something that's suitable for, for human consumption? The scientific literature on soy is pretty extensive. And you can find basically any conclusion that you want. There have been many, 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 many studies that show that soy is harmful, um, that, show, that shows that soy is not best for human nutrition. And you can find the opposite that soy is uh, perfectly fine and in fact quite healthy for human nutrition. It, there, there's lots of science on that in either direction. I would say that the most most recent and up-to-date 
studies on soy show that lots of the findings of the past were um, unfounded and not necessarily true. So I'm not sure if you know where this started. It started back in 1951 with no. uh, two Australian chemists. And they were, uh, in, in Australia, they were looking at what the cause of was for an epidemic of infertility in sheep. And so what it was, there's a, a compound uh, present in a type of clover that they were eating called genistein. Mm -hmm. And that is the same estrogen, uh, the primary estrogen that's also in soybean. So they, eat, they were eating this clover and they were becoming infertile because it was impacting... Um, their hormones. From that, then that also became some studies about phytoestrogens in rats. Of course, both sheep and uh, rats me me metabolize things differently. But what people didn't really look at is the amount of levels that were in these studies. So they were feeding the rats extremely high levels of phytoestrogens that you wouldn't find in food. And if you were to get as much as the sheep were getting from the clover, you'd have to drink more than um, a thousand cartons of soy milk a day or eat 8,000 soy burgers, or around 800 pounds of tofu a day. And that's the first thing to think about, is that the, the, the doses are just, were just incredibly different in terms of mm -hmm. the effect. Mm -hmm. Now, there are two case reports, and this is just of single people, right? Of people, sort of two, two men developing uh, gynecomastia from, they thought, they, weren't, they don't know, they never did an interventional study, they just happened to be eating 14, between 14 and 20 servings of soy a day in these two single individuals. So just the weakest form of evidence, two single cases of people having some sort of feminizing effects. And it just so happened that correlationally that they were having huge amounts of soy. I mean, it was like pretty much all they were eating. <clears throat> and so as a combination of these things between the sheep and the study in rats, and then these two case reports, you know, this is sort of where this myth started that soy could be feminizing for men. There's other myths as well around, you know, breast cancer and prostate cancer because those are sort of hormonal cancers. Um, but if you look at the actual robust evidence, there seems to be no problem at all. Now, there is a dosing element where getting to uh, 14 or eight, even eight servings or more a day, there may be some issues that people aren't sure. There's no concrete evidence. But eating in the sort of normal amounts that anyone would eat, really no uh, no issues with it at all. But obviously, this can be really confusing, okay? Now, there's something to remember. Soy is a very recent addition to the human, uh, human diet. Very, very, very recent. And the only reason, let's be honest, the only reason that soy is being consumed en masse is because it's a good product. It's a good commodity. It makes for a very good market commodity because it's easy to grow, easy to transport, easy to process. It just makes for a good commodity. So they bamboozle you with all sorts of science, more than likely commercial science, to extol the benefits of soy. Okay, let's be honest about that. For the vast majority of human history, soy was actually not considered human nutrition or, or food for human beings. Soy was used primarily for its value in fertilizing crops and fertilizing soil and fixing nitrogen. It, wa it, wasn't, it wasn't necessarily used as food, okay? It was only around 1st century, 2nd century BC, somewhere around there, where the Chinese of antiquity started to ferment soy and discovered that if you coagulated it then uh, and cooked it, then you could make this interesting thing called uh, tofu. But it was not primarily used as nutrition. It was used for its value in agriculture. Here's a little article that kind of sums it up. There's a historical use in Asia. And it seems to make sense that edamame would be a traditional food since it is unprocessed and simple to prepare. Historical references appear to bear this out in the earliest documented reference for the word edamame occurred in 1275 AD when the Japanese monk Nishiren wrote a thankful... Okay, blah, blah, blah. Um, okay, we'll look at this quote. An herbal guide from 1406 Ming Dynasty indicates the whole pods of young soybeans could be eaten or ground for use with flour, but it recommended such uses only during times of famine. Uh, a Materia Medica from 1620 recommends edamame, but only for medicinal purpose of killing bad or evil chi. By 1929, however, edamame was definitely on some menus. William Morse of the USDA reported on a field trip to China that 
as early as May, small bundles of plants with full-grown pods were seen on the market. At the present time, the market is virtually flooded with bundles of plants with full-grown pods, the seeds of which are also full-grown. The pods are boiled in salt water and the beans are eaten from the pods. So where would the negativity around soy come from? The negativity around soy comes from a couple of things. You have things called um, protease inhibitors, okay? Or trypsin. Trypsin is the is the protein that's, uh, or the element that's in question there. And these protease inhibitors, they're plant protective chemicals that are created by the plant in order to protect it so that it can, so that the seeds can grow, so that the, the beans can grow. And when you try to eat something that has these protective chemicals in it, these protective um, inhibitors, growth inhibitors in it, it makes it difficult to digest because it resists being broken down and unpackaging, right? Because the bean wants to only unpackage when the conditions are correct so that it can grow into another plant. So when you eat them, it can cause problems. And these protease inhibitors in soybeans are not apparently, now of course, we can't, I can't corroborate this, but are apparently not broken down by heat or cooking, okay? There's also the question of the estrogen mimickers, okay? You hear this all the time. The estrogen mimicking effects, the phyto, the, the isoflavones, okay? Isoflavones. What is an isoflavone? A flavone, it, for the flavonoids, there is a class of plant chemicals, okay, of, of chemicals that plants produce called flavonoids. And in the flavonoid umbrella, there are many different uh, classes, okay, there are many different classes of flavonoids. Flav, flavones are one of those classes of flavonoids, okay. And iso, iso just means same. So the, the same flavone, that's, that's basically what it's saying. These isoflavones, okay, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but they apparently, apparently mimic estrogen in the body. And so the body can, so it can apparently bind to estrogen receptors in the cells and um, cause some problems, hormonal problems. Okay, so this is the conventionally accepted danger of eating soy products, okay? And again, you can find lots of research on this. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. The most recent studies, like I was saying though, the most recent findings, according to many of the health experts out there, show that the estrogen mimicking effects of the isoflavones in soy do not impair hormonal function. Okay, there has been cancer research in the past that shows soy consumption can help with um, with cancer, with postmenopausal women in regulating hormone function, helps lower cholesterol, all this kind of stuff. Okay, all these wonderful things. But here's the deal. Okay, we're talking about optimal health here. All right, on here on this channel, we are talking about the best, the optimal choices. And conventional science is usually is usually going to have some other interest at, at hand. And as we know, when it comes to conventional food culture science, we are simply using science to validate the marketplace. Okay, we're using science to validate the existence of a massive food uh, marketplace. And food commodities that make for good commodities are generally going to get good science because we need them to sell. You cannot escape the damaging effects of cooked food in the human body. You cannot, okay? When you heat and process and treat food, it changes. The chemical structure is adulterated and it becomes something that it no longer was before. All right. So this is what I mean when it when I say it depends on who is asking the question. I can't just say, you know, when people say, what about soy? Go. You know, it's just it needs more context and it needs to be tailored to the to the person who's asking. Yes, we can make general comments, of course, which is what I'm doing now. But in order to be the best um, health educators that we can, we need to tailor those responses to who's asking and we need to affix context to it, all right? So it depends on who the person is. If you are the type of person that wants to be generally healthy, you want to enjoy a wide variety of healthy foods, but you're, you're not ready for any kind of raw food only diet or anything above that. You're not 
terribly interested in deeper cleansing. You you want health and wellness, and you but you also want to enjoy the full the full panoply, the full gamut of of cool, fun, social eating occasions, you know, without restrictions and whatnot. Plant based, sure, if if you're on the healthier side of that, but but still, you 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 want you want the food culture life. Then that changes my answer. Then my answer is go ahead and have soy. It has not been seen to be damaging in the way that the older science has has um has shown it to be or has questioned it to be. But <laughs> Therein lies the problem. I mean, just because some science is older than newer science does not at all mean that the older science is wrong. Uh, And that's exactly the problem with relying on science because we have bodies of data showing the exact opposite, right? So it's like, well, what, what are you supposed to do? That's why I choose to rely on things that I can absolutely verify for myself, right? I know that cooking and processing denatures and devivifies your food. I can see objectively that if I cook a potato, it doesn't sprout and a raw potato will, right? So we know that cooking destroys life. So if you are a raw foodist, if you're looking at natural hygiene, if you're looking at getting the, the, the best form of vitality from your food and from your life and you're interested in higher levels of cleansing, then the answer changes a little bit. Which leads us to the question, can you eat raw soy, okay? So can you eat soy in its raw, unadulterated state? So uh, people might get confused. They, they know that you can go to a Japanese restaurant and, um, and have edamame, and they think that that edamame is, is raw, okay? Uh, it, it's it's not okay, and there's a difference. See, this is this is what edamame looks like. So let's go through the difference between edamame and soy uh, and soybeans, raw soybeans. So edamame are soybeans that are picked very immature, and there's always, in my mind, a bit of a problem when you pick things that are immature. If they're immature, unripe, uh, then they're probably not meant to be eaten in that state okay anyway edamame is when you pick these soybeans in their immature state and you cook them or boil them or or process them in some light way but usually boiling or or cooking in some way and you salt them or season them and then you eat them okay so edamame is not raw soybeans so if you're a conventional foodist and you can find actual organic non-GMO soybeans and it's some restaurant that that provides that and you don't mind eating cooked food then that's fine have them you're still going to be generally healthy if you are a raw foodist then this is disqualified for you again disqualified there's no need to be dogmatic about this it's it's just it's up to you it depends on what you are looking for what your motivation is if you're a raw foodist that doesn't mind having a little bit of cooked food here or there I, that's your choice to make right some people don't want that don't want to make that that compromise so or edamame is not the same thing as raw soybeans uh soybean okay so If we're talking about raw soybeans, can you eat raw soybeans? Let's just say you can pick them right off the tree, all right, and eat them. Uh, Raw soybeans tend to be, this isn't a great picture of one, but uh, raw soybeans, when they ripen, will get a bit darker and paler in color, yellowish and pale. What happens with the bean inside is the bean gets harder. Oh, here's a picture. The bean actually gets a little bit tougher and firmer than than the younger soybeans. And that's when you can taste the, there's, uh, okay, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I believe the saponins are attributed to the taste, the bitter taste of soybeans. Uh, again, it's, it's saponins are just another, another type of protective element in the plant. And apparently it's that that you're tasting when you get a bitter tone from the soybean. So if we're eating raw, non-GMO soybeans straight from the field, in their ripened state, okay, probably what you're going to taste is you're going to taste something that's all right, if you're hungry, a little bit bitter, not not the most pleasant thing for for you to eat, but tolerable. And some people have more tolerance 
than, than others. And generally, generally speaking, when you taste bitterness from the food that you're eating, it's a general warning sign that the thing is not the greatest to eat. You, you don't want things that are bitter. I know that there are going to be thousands of problems with that with that general statement. I know that the, the, the whole community of um, bitter edibles and wild bitters and whatnot, I, I know that there's going to be all sorts of problems with that statement. Okay, that's fine. If you're asking me, your taste sensitivities are designed to give you indications of whether something is suitable or not. And it's very difficult to deny the taste that we experience when something is insuitable to our palates is bitterness. Okay bitterness, sourness. These are not pleasant tastes. And if they're not pleasant, you have to assume that that's there for a reason. Okay? Oh, right. Sorry, I had this article here that I wanted to show you. Um, th this, is, this is a picture of what raw soybeans would look like, okay? Uh, so that's a raw whole soybean. Uh, super high in protein, right? We, we, we get this a lot, right? The reason we, we like them is that they're super high in protein. This is why soy is, well, one of the reasons why soy is fed to animals, because it's so high in protein. It can help to bulk up animals. But this is interesting. So this is from the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. The Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources um, puts out this article on soybeans and cows and calves. So soybeans are approximately 40% crude protein. Soybeans should be gradu introduced gradually into the diet. Ah, okay. Raw soybeans contain a trypsin-inhibiting enzyme that is important to protein digestion in non-ruminants and monogastrics. Nursing calves and calves less than 300 pounds should not be fed raw whole soybeans. That's interesting. Why should a calf not be fed raw whole raw whole soybeans. Feeding raw whole soybeans in the place of the distiller's grains to meet protein needs in a diet that is predominantly corn would likely result in decreased animal performance. So this is interesting. They don't even recommend raw soybeans for cows, right? And let's not forget, cows are actual herbivores that are that are much, much more well equipped to to be eating vegetable roughage and vegetable protein and vegetable matter in general than frugivores than humans human beings so it's i just found that interesting that um that it's not recommended to feed even actual herbivores raw soybean which might inform human beings decision to eat raw soybeans straight from straight from the plant like this however however human beings are not animals and yes there is something to be said about how animals in particular process different nutrients as compared to human beings so but determining what the sameness and difference is amongst all the millions of, of nutrients that are out there sure you can get lost in that forever um who knows and the last thing we'll talk about is tofu okay so the original question that i was asked what about tofu well again it's the same type of thing right if you are the conventional vegan that doesn't doesn't mind eating processed products and cooked products, then yeah, go ahead. Have, have some tofu if, if you want and if you like it, all right? It's exceptionally, exceptionally high in protein. I, I would say that if you're looking at general health, soy products and soy in general is, is probably going to be giving you, if you include it in your diet, all the time, okay, daily intake, you're probably getting too much protein. You're probably getting more protein than your body needs or wants. I would say you're much better off getting, I, I, I really don't even want to say getting your protein because this is so, this is not something you ever need to think about. You only need to think about what is the best food for you and, and protein is taken care of. So I don't, I don't even want to go into if you're looking for getting the right protein, because that's not something that ever you should have to think about. But let's just say, for example, if protein is the, the concern, oh, you might be a bodybuilder. Okay, no, no. You, let's say you're, you're a bodybuilder. Okay, then this turns into a concern. Then, sure, 
sure. Use use some soy if you want, uh, but I would probably opt for something else. Lentils, split peas, quinoa, all of those are really, really good sources of nutrition, okay? Yes, protein, but good nutrition and much cleaner than any of the other types of um, animal products that you could find. Tofu, however, is not raw, okay? Tofu is not a raw product. So if you are a raw vegan and you want to avoid pro- the, the problems with processed food, you will not find that with tofu because tofu needs to be heated and it needs to be coagulated using uh, chemicals, all right? Um, some fairly it's fairly simple. When I say chemicals, uh, there's a chemical called uh, nigari. I believe it's called nigari. And basically, it's the byproduct of heating seawater. So if you heat seawater, evaporate it, get rid of the, the, the salt, like the larger salt crystals, then there will be a leftover type of salt that is called nigari. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. And that helps to coagulate the cooked soybean mulch. So if you have soybeans, you soak them, then you heat them and you make a mulch, and then you add this coagulant, and then you dry it out and it becomes tofu. So it's not raw. So if you are a raw vegan or someone who wants to stick to a raw diet, you cannot, um, you, you, you don't want to be eating tofu because it's cooked. But again, that it's up to you. If you want to every once in a while add tofu to your, to your raw diet, you can make that choice. Many raw foodists don't want to make that compromise. If you do, or you're, you're happy with that, then, then go for it. But you, you still won't be able to avoid the complications or the implications of cooked plant matter, of cooked food, because that's just, you, we just have to live with that. We just have to accept that. And if we're willing to uh, take the consequences, then, then we can. All right. Okay, guys, that's about it. Those are the broad strokes. If you're asking me personally, do I, what, how would I feel about consuming soy? products in my diet? The answer is no. I, I, I wouldn't. I, there's, no, there's no advantage that you get from eating soy products that you can't get from other far more digestible, far more easily assimilated foods like fruits and simple leafy green vegetables. In, in my case, almost exclusively fruits, but for many raw foodists, fruits and vegetables. There might even be problems with sprouted soybeans. So we're talking about raw soybeans that are sprouted you know everyone goes crazy over sprouts uh there may even be problems with sprouted soybeans that concentrate some of the enzymes the protective enzymes in soybeans Uh, i can't corroborate that there is a fairly popular book on the subject though and uh, it's called the whole story of soy by uh, kayla t daniel Um, this book is apparently apparently uh, loaded with um, a lot of research on the history of soy and everything that you'd want to know about soy and uh, so you can you can you can check that out if you want okay well i hope i've fleshed out everything that you'd want to know about soy in this little video i uh, really appreciate your time and attention thank you so much guys if you like this video and like videos like this then make sure to subscribe to the free mountain society and hit the bell notification so that you don't miss any other future videos and yeah i should probably do a couple And I should probably do these more often, just do some response videos to common questions that I get in the comments. So as always, leave your questions in the comments in this video or in any of the videos. And if uh, something is worth responding to, then I will definitely do that. Okay. Thanks a lot, guys. Love you very much. And we'll see you next time here on the Free Melon Society. Bye-bye.